gap standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Studying to show ourselves approved Rightly divine the word of truth Increasing our faith to envision our freedom So we all can glorify our God Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, to joy of love Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Here to the joy of love Wanna hear him say good And good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Here to the joy of love Of love Joy of love Love Joy of the Lord, of the Lord. All right, good morning. I'm Art Harmon, and welcome to Standing in the Gap USA. This is our Christian education ministry where we tackle some of the more difficult, sensitive subjects in Christianity. And boy, have we tackled one in, in this study, the Constitution and the Bible. So... Put on your seat belts and get ready because uh, some of the things we get into, some people aren't going to like or appreciate. But as we always say, we stand in the gap on the truth. We stand in the gap on the word of God. And that gap has been created for th those who don't believe have been pulled away from, uh, from uh, 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 God has created a gap. And God is looking for those willing to stand in the gap for him. And so that's why we're here in the gap. Sometimes it gets lonely down here in the gap. But that's what we said. We told God we'd do it, and that's where we are and who we are. And before we get started into our um, study this week or the part of our study this week, let's say a prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father. You brought us safely so far, Father, through all the trials and tribulations of this world, Father. And we thank you for that. Father, we ask that you bless all those who have taken the time to tune in to this broadcast. And all those that will view it at a later time on one of the social media platforms. And Father, we just ask that you open our hearts, open our minds, and fill it with the truth of your word. We ask this in your name for your sake. Amen. 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 And also... Um, I need to introduce you to someone who um, does all the heavy lifting, I'd say, for, for this, who keeps us on the air, keeps our outlines going, and gives you all the updates that you need. This collaboration that we have is God-blessed, and I'm just so thankful to have her. And this is my wife, Marvel. Marvel. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. It's kind of dreary outside today, but I'm happy to be here on this final Saturday 
of our year of presentations. So I want to let you know um, we are going to take off for the Christmas and Kwanzaa and New Year holiday. Uh, we will be back on Saturday, January 7th, still talking about the Constitution versus the Bible. I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and Happy Kwanzaa and Happy New Year and a blessed holiday season. And I think that's all I have for you right now. Well, we, we would hope that uh, those who are watching can get into the room, right? Um... Oh, I forgot to tell you. I got the room back up. So, you can look in the chat box and you will see a link to the room for live interaction and also the outlines, um, link to the uh, access to the outlines is in the chat box. So, please come in and let us see your smiling face and hear what you have to say today. If you can't get into the room or you don't have a device that can do that, please Type whatever you have to say, your comments, your questions, into the um, chat box. Okay, thank you. And we uh, we uh, encourage that participation. All right, now, um, as we get into this Constitution versus the Bible, we have to keep in mind that we are engaged in, as we talked about in our previous study, about angels and demons in the spirit world is that we are in the midst of, of spiritual warfare and the spiritual warfare that we talked about before in, in, in that study it continues into this study in almost every study that we do and the reason for it is as I put up on the screen Ephesians six twelve, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Meaning, our problems start in the spirit world. And it influences us in the real world. And so, when you look at that evil person uh, that is doing this and doing that, he is under the control and power of demonic forces. And those demonic forces don't stop just at you. They, they, they also attack and control governments and government authorities. And as we said before, you have demons that are over certain uh, jurisdictions, some certain countries. And there's um, scriptural uh, uh, evidence of that. So um, it's, it's appropriate that in this study, that we don't lose sight of the fact that we're in a spirit in spiritual warfare. And we have to understand that if we're in spiritual warfare, we need to have the weapons that are, are necessary to fight this spiritual war. As we always say, grenades and tanks and javelins and all that, not going to do you a bit of good. Your gun that you keep upstairs under your bed, not going to do you any good in spiritual warfare. So that's what we, we're, we're promoting. Sit back and um, understand that you are in a war, and this means war. Got joy in my soul. God is in control. I got Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day, but I'm watching while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back. This means war. Alright, so we set the stage. This means war. Alright, so let's, uh, let's talk about this study. Constitution versus the Bible. And the reason that we're, we're, we're presenting this is because there are some schools of thought and even, even among uh, Christians and uh, uh, religious folk that the Constitution is above the Bible. And that when we're talking about Constitution, we don't have to worry about what the Bible says. And so, you know, since that is a thought that people have, that became the basis of our our study. And so we're going to look into the Constitution, some of the uh, Declaration also, and um, the uh, Bible. And, and we look at the, the uh, this country as being 
founded by the founders. They call them the founders, okay? That's the, yes, your Washington, that's your Jeffersons and your Adams and your, and your um, Madisons, Monroe, et cetera, et cetera. Those that wrote those documents, those who uh, advocated those documents, and those who um, will, um, we look back a lot of times, courts do, and even politicians, whatever, as to what were they thinking when they put these words in this document. And we should look back, see what they thought, and that should control what we do here today. Now, we have uh, been through a couple of sessions of this study, and uh, I would say that we need to rethink that, to be truthful. As we talked about last time, the question that we have is, the Bible is an, the eternal word, we say, inspired. Written by men, but inspired by God through men. Some people say that the Constitution was a divinely inspired document also. And that's why it's on the level of the uh, Bible, etc. Now, let me tell you what one of the um, most, most famous evangelists said about all that. And I'm sorry, that's the wrong Okay, let me get out. Give me a screen. I have you. Okay, good. I don't know why I am not where I'm supposed to be. But we'll get there. All right. Let's see here. All right, there it is. The eternal word of, uh, of the Bible. And this is what the most famous evangelist said, Billy Graham. Say, a constitution is made up of principles by which a nation or people are governed. The Bible stands as the supreme constitution for all mankind, not just Christians. Its laws apply equally to all who live under its domain without exception or special interpretation. Now, when you stop there, because the laws of the Bible apply equally to all. And you remember in the Declaration it says all men are created equal. Hmm. So God's word was given not only to those who believe in him and follow him, but to all mankind. Unbelief in God does not excuse anyone from God's ultimate judgment. According to Billy Graham, the uh, Bible is superior to the Constitution. And another theologian put it this way. Simply put, the Holy Scriptures in which we find Jesus and the United States Constitution in which we don't are mutually exclusive. And in short, and this is the most important uh, part of this, you have to pick one. You have to choose. You have to elect. Same, same thing that uh, Adam and Eve had to do and what every man and woman since then has had to do. They had to. They have to make a choice. God gave us the, the right to make a choice. Some people want to take that choice away from you, but God gave you that right. Now, you can choose wrong and suffer consequences, or you can choose right. And so what we do here at uh, Standing in the Gap, we try to give you the truth so that you can make an informed choice. And then you have to, you know, make your own mind up. You have your own decision. As to what, it, but understand the consequences are yours. It's not your mother's, your father's, or anybody like that. It's yours, and it's eternal, and it will be attached to you. All right. So um, you have to choose. Now, what, what, where we've been is that we've been examining this uh, thing about looking back to see what the founders think or thought as they were writing these documents, the Declaration and the Constitution, and. What we found, and as I always say, then in the Constitutional Convention and the writing of the Declaration and all that, there are a whole bunch of people sitting there arguing about it, compromising and negotiating about what goes in and what should stay out and all that kind of thing. And um, and it wasn't it wasn't a pretty sight, to be truthful. Um, but. When we look back and say, okay, as they were sitting there, as they were deciding what's to go into this declaration, what's to go into this constitution, 
Um, and we have our problems today that we can't seem to figure out which way to go. So we look back and see, what were they thinking? That can give us guidance. I don't, I don't necessarily ascribe to that. <laughs> because it's hard for me to believe that uh, someone who lived in the 17th century, 17th, 18th century, um, would have any idea of how to address a lot of the problems that we have here today. But, so we do that. So what we did was we went back in our previous study and we found out, we looked at each of these, uh, well not all of them, but the major um, founders, as they call them, to see, okay, what did they believe? Did they believe in, in, in God? Did they believe in Jesus, uh, they believe in the Trinity. I mean, if we're looking for them, then we need. Uh, and 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 you say this, these documents were divinely inspired. Then you know I've got to. Uh, we need to understand that. And what we found was shocking. Well, so hold on a second. You say those documents, the Constitution and the uh, Declaration. Declaration, were divinely inspired. No, I said that people say that. Okay, but <laughs> what people are saying it because I don't recall that any of those quote unquote founders said they were divinely inspired to write these documents. Okay, well, you have to take my word for it. Um, that is, uh, I haven't put a. a, um, a but I'm just saying, quote unquote, people say it, but we don't have any, there's no authoritative anything that says that anybody claimed that they were divinely inspired to write those documents. They did claim it. They did. So Jefferson and them, they said that God inspired them to write that stuff? They they said it was um, basing it on God's word and divine. And then people who have interpreted it Okay. that. And All right. even present day politicians um, adhere to that. So yes, yes. The position of a lot of people is that they were uh, divinely inspired, and as a as a matter of fact, um, they allege that they are some of the most beautiful words ever written. And um, as we know, going through that, that may not be the case. Okay, and probably not the case. But where I was going with this is that um, if we look at what these founders thought, what they believed in, then maybe we can get an understanding of where they were coming from when they put certain words and phrases into those documents. And what we found out is these these founders were deist. Deist. And so we have to explain what deist is. A deist believes that God exists. So we believe in God. Created the world, but does not interfere with his creation. Meaning that he, he created it, then he left us to our own. And doesn't interfere with it. Deists Deny the Trinity, deny the inspiration of the Bible, they deny the deity of Christ, they deny that miracles ever happen, and any supernatural act of redemption or salvation, or salvation. Deism pictures God as uncaring and uninvolved. Thomas Jefferson was a famous deist, referring, referring often in his writings to a term called providence, and that's because he wasn't going with Trinity, Inspiration Bible, Deity of Christ, Miracles, etc. So, and and as we look, the only one that we talked about that it was a bit unclear as to exactly how he, uh, or, or, or what he believed, was George Washington. Although scholars have said that he was a deist also. So we know Thomas Jefferson was, John Adams was, even Madison. Okay, and and the thing that that should hit you strongly is that they deny the deity of Christ, the divinity of Christ, I, and and but call themselves Christians. So I don't understand how you be how you're a Christian and you don't believe in Jesus Christ, or in that He is our Savior, because if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, the question is, how do you get saved? How do you get saved? And what that leaves you with is the same thing the Muslims have. is that, do your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds? And therefore, as you approach uh, eternity in your life, you never know. Because well, you know you had a bunch of bad deeds. 
you, you, you believe you had a bunch of good deeds. And so the question is, I guess I'll find out when I get to the uh, pearly gates as to which outweighs the other. Now the belief in Jesus Christ says that you can be assured of your salvation now. And so what we have is the founders who wrote these documents did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God or that he was the path to our salvation. And basically that they were on their own. God created us. He left us alone. It's up to us to uh, uh, decide all our issues and resolve all our issues. And we don't, we don't have or need any uh, divine intervention. And if you want to get into each specific one of the founders, um, you'll have to look at last week's uh, um, uh, broadcast re uh, video because we detailed it there. Okay. All right. And then we talked about the forms of government. The forms of government. Because, um, and, and which one is the United States and all that. And that's necessary if we're going to look at the, look at what this Constitution says. And what it means, what it stands for. According to Yale professor, there are three main types of political systems today. Democracies, totalitarian regime. regime and sitting between those is authoritarian regimes, uh, which are a hybrid of democracy and totalitarianism. Democracies, of course, a pure democracy is one where the people hold all the power and, and their votes and what they uh, 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 dictate what the government is, the decisions that are made and all that. And so that's like 51%. Uh, 51%. Of the people, if they want a certain thing, then that's what it's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And generally, they all have uh, democracies have their representatives who are voted in by the people, and so that's that's a democracy. Totalitarianism is basically the opposite. You don't have any rights. <laughs> the people don't have any rights. The uh, person in charge is usually a dictator, uh, or whatever, who uh, makes all the decisions. And you have to follow them, or they use force on you and all that kind of thing. Now, when they talk about authoritarian, that's like a blend of the democracy and the totalitarianism. The authoritarian still has basically supreme, uh, uh, the vast majority of the power of the state and a certain amount of power, very limited, as you can find in uh, China and, uh, and what's happening in Iran and all that is that uh, certain things are delegated to the people or to uh, uh, other authorities. So the strong man does most of the thing. But then you have your little right to do this. So they combine them. And they claim that the totalitarian and authoritarian governments work better than democracies. They say you can't get anything done in a democracy because people you have to wait on people to vote. And they could vote uh, something crazy, you know. <laughs> And then you have to uh, abide by that. And they say it's much easier to telling them what to do and have them follow it. And, and, and you know, some say, okay, then we're we just going to give them a little crumb, but we're still going to take control and do everything. Those are the ones that are the main types of political systems today, they say. Now, we go in that. And one that they don't mention uh, because they're talking about the main types today. That doesn't mean there aren't others. And one of them that they don't mention that had been around for forever is a theocracy. You see, the term theocracy derives from uh, the Greek word, and it's a, uh, called the rule of God. And um, basically, uh, historians say that type of, uh, of, of uh, government kind of stemmed from uh, Israel and its its beginnings. And actually from the time of the Exodus until the time that they decided that they wanted a king and they crowned Saul, the um, it was a theocracy, okay? Um, and, and what a theocracy does is say that there's a special relationship between the ruler and God, 
or in this case, um, the ruling um, organization or, or whatever. And, you know, like in Israel, you know, you had Moses, right? Moses brought him out of exit, out of uh, Egypt and had that, he had that personal relationship with God and he would consult with God and God would tell him how to do things and all that and what to do and all that. And so that was basically one of the purest uh, theocracies. And then you have uh, uh, others like in, in Iran and uh, uh, some other countries where, where you could say, well, that looks like a theocracy, except for most of those don't say that that political leader has this special relationship with God. And so he may get some thoughts from God or whatever. Not like Moses. Moses actually had a special relationship with God. So your your places like Iran and all that, they have a religious uh, part of their government. And then they have a uh, um, secular. And so they kind of combine the two. And so that's, uh, that's something that we need to look into or we need to understand. Because we have to say, we have to ask, okay, what does God say? What does God say about the type of government we can have? And does God bless a democracy or an authoritarian uh, society or a totalitarian society or, or what? And that's what we're going to get into in some, to some extent today. Okay. Let's go to Romans, Romans 13, give you some scripture to let us know, or get an idea of what God thinks about this. And, and some people don't like, <laughs> don't like this scripture, but it's right there. He says, let every soul, this is Paul, be subject to the governing authority. And it's uh, it's uh, significant that this is Romans, because Rome, Rome was the governing authority. Uh, let every soul not some, every soul be subject to the governing authority. And he places, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, some people have issues with that. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Whoever resists the authority will bring judgment on himself. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid, unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. All right. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Um, it goes on. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of you, because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending co continually to this very thing. Reader. Are render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Mm, okay. Now, this scripture directs us to submit to the government because all authority comes from God. This is scripture. This is what God's divine word is saying. Now, some people look at that and say, well, some, some um, governments are, uh, are evil. <laughs> we should submit to them? Well, the scripture that directs us to submit to the government because all authority comes from God. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, the persons who are in there will obey um, Micah 6, 8 which is to uh, have justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Now, rebellion against the government, it says, is rebellion against God. 
and will bring judgment on those who do that. Now, maybe that's why some of these uh, some of these founders didn't didn't particularly like the New Testament because uh, they were involved in a rebellion against the the government. Yeah, I was just getting ready to say that precludes revolution of any sort. Um, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you're gonna take it literally, because if you if you if you have an evil or a wrong government and you rebel, there's a way to rebel. If you remember, uh, Jesus was a revolutionary himself. He rebelled against the uh, uh, governing authorities of the Sadducees and the uh, Pharisees, change and all that, and that's why they killed him. Um, so there's a way to do things. And remember, uh, the scripture says there's a time and a place for every, or a season, for every uh, purpose under heaven. And it includes a time for war. And then remember, um, war, God uh, instituted war against uh, a lot of the people over there so that the Israelites could claim their their territory. So um, there's it's 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 more in depth than are involved than just to say no rebellion at all. According to how you do it, you remember Martin Martin Luther King was uh, basically rebelling. Oh yes, and but he did it. Uh, Nonviolently, nonviolently, and so there there are ways to do that. But in any event, um, this is what Romans thirteen says: the Scripture, we're directed to respect and honor authority. And remember, this was during the Roman times, all right. And the Jews hated the Romans, and Jesus is saying we need to. Uh, our our Paul is saying that that God has inspired him to say these things, respect and honor the Romans. Hmm. It's also seen uh, as justifying the payment of taxes. Now this is, this is, if you believe the Bible is divinely inspired, then that's what it says. That's what it says. Now, remember, the uh, Israelites had the theocracy, which means God is the ruler. God is the king. And then they got to a point where they said, we don't want God as a king. We want to have kings like all the other nations. Hmm. They got to that point. Because prior to then, your rulers were the judges and the prophets were the ones. God sent the prophet. He raised up a, a judge and all that. And so that's how the government worked. That's how the government worked. Now, let's go to Isaiah. Go, go. Uh, into the Old Testament, Isaiah 33, 22. It says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Sounds like when we say, well, what does God say? That it's pretty clear in the Bible what God said. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Now, when you're in, in, in those positions where you are a lawmaker um, and um, or a judge or whatever, this says the Lord is your judge, which means you should get your inspiration from God. You should get your information from God as if you're a judge or a lawgiver. You're making laws and all that kind of thing. Get it from him. And he will save us. That's Isaiah. Now, when you look at what Isaiah is saying in this, he talks about three elements of government. Hmm. What, what element? The judiciary, the judge, the legislature, the lawgiver, and the king, the, uh, in our plan, we call executive. it the presidents, the executive. Yeah. Right. So when it came time to devising a constitution, it may be that that three-pronged uh, government that we have, checks and balances and all that kind of thing, was inspired by, by Isaiah. 
Now, you say, okay, well, that's what else you got? Okay. Uh, and, and remember, we stand on the Word of God. That's why I'm giving you these scriptures, okay? And so what did, what did God think about government? Go to Exodus 18.21. Moreover, and remember, after they got uh, escaped from uh, Egypt, God took them over to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. They stayed there a year or two or whatever while God prepared them to proceed up to the promised land because they weren't ready. They weren't ready. They still had uh, little idols and things like that. And he had to teach them, you're going to be my people. This is how you have to do. And so this is part of what he's he's telling them is that now that you're out of there and you're going to go uh, uh, up here in my name, this is what you need to do. You shall select from all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. So what that is saying, basically, and remember at this time, God is the king, okay? And he, he's telling Moses on, and, 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 uh, to select people of able people. We sometimes forget that today. <laughs> the able part. <laughs> 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 if you look at our legislature, <laughs> you have to say, I don't know if they're so able. <laughs> you look at some of these Marjorie Taylor Greens. And, and, uh, uh, I mean, we could go down the list of them. They don't seem to be able to do a whole lot other than make money for themselves and do whatever Trump tells them to do. And then it goes on, such as fear God. There we go. You got to fear God. Now, I don't want to hear about this separation of church and state right now. Okay? Because, uh, remember, this is a theocracy that God is, is uh, administering here. But, able men, those that fear God, men of truth, truth. We stand on the word of God in the gap, and we stand on truth. This is what God wants. Hating covetousness, meaning coveting things for yourself, okay, against your brother or your sister, whatever. And place these men who have these qualities and traits over the people, rulers of thousands, and this is the hierarchy of your power. Now, if you're rulers of ten, you're not as powerful as a ruler of a thousand, okay? And let them judge the people at all times. But, and basically saying, if you put able men who fear God, men of truth, who hate covetousness, then let them judge the people because they will then judge them uh, justly. Justly. With mercy. And walking humbly with their God. That's Exodus 18.21. Well, it goes on, doesn't it? Let's go to Samuel. 1 Samuel 8.4. It says, Then all the rulers of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. He had some terrible sons. You yeah, he did. He, <laughs> he had some pretty bad sons. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is where they reject God as a king. God has been the king. and um, But they said, We want to have kings just like other nations. Now the kings of other nations weren't believers in God. And they were they had their own idols and things like that. But what happens in a situation? Let's let's take your life. And then you separate your life from God. Now you're on your own, right? Is that where you want to be? Generally what happens when you move God out the picture is the demons come in. The evil comes in. You're, you are not the person that God wants you to be. Your own choice, though. You move them out the way. So what Israel is saying here is, let's move God to the side. Let's, let's elect a king and let him judge us. We don't want God doing anything. And if you read on, it'll say, 
he had to tell Samuel because Samuel was all upset thinking, oh, man, I was, this is my fault. And God said, no, no, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So when I say, what does God want? It's pretty clear that God didn't want this. He didn't want this. And he explained to them, when you get a king, like what you're asking for, this is what you get. So Samuel told uh, all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. Meaning that war. You're going to be having to, to fight wars and things like that. He will appoint captains over thousands and captains over fifties will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest. Covetousness, right? And some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariot. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of this king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. I hear you on that day. Basically saying, when you give somebody all that power, totalitarian, maybe authoritarian, or whatever, they start to look out for themselves and not for you. They need an army, so who's going to do that? You guys are going to do that. They need uh, grain and fields and animals, and where's he going to get those? He's going to get those from you. He's gonna um, he's gonna take your um, your uh, women, uh, make them servants. He's gonna make your men servants and all that for him. That's what God is saying happens when you put somebody in that position. Now let's fast forward to today. Let's look at let's look at Russia. Okay, this Putin guy. Remember when Putin came in, he wasn't no rich guy. Uh, all that. Now he's one of the richest men in the world. Some people say he's the richest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Because what? We don't know how much money he got. Yeah. And what did he do? He's starting this war, so he's taking all the young men and putting them in his uh, war machine and all that. And that's, and that's what that's what uh, Samuel was telling them. That God had told him what's going to happen. I mean, the, the analogies are stark when you look at it. And he'll tax you. And the taxes he'll use to uh, raise his army and keep his army and pay his servants and all that. And, and of course, benefit himself. So that's what the king does. Now, you got to understand, God God did ask for a tenth. He was king. He wanted a tenth. But um, then you could do whatever you want with it after, after that. But this is what this the human king will do. And that's what... That's what uh, God is talking about. Now, let's um, let's talk about something else. First off, do you, hopefully you understand that what God envisioned to be the government is not what we have as government today. Okay? Um, now, some people say, but what about separation of church and state? As I said previously, I think it was last week or before, you will not find separation of church and state in the Declaration or in the Constitution. Now, this concept has been uh, uh, revered in America, and it's been raised to a level where people actually think, that, well, this is something that God wants. But if I, what I've shown you is what God envisioned, he didn't he didn't envision any separation between church and state. And 
as I indicated, if you look through the I mean through the Constitution, you don't find that. Okay? And some people had a somebody had a question the other day, they say, Well, why if if there's a separation of church and state that they still use the Bible to swear in their uh <laughs> presidents all and the oaths. all the all yes. the oaths that they have and all that, and how they get up there in Congress and talk about God and all this other stuff is because there's really no prohibition to that in the Constitution. Well, uh, wasn't it in the Constitution that it said uh, we won't establish a state-led church? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's where that's where people get it wrong. Yeah, that's where they, I mean, that's the kind of the foundation for that thought that there should be a separation so when they uh when they talk about separation of church and state and then at the same time saying that we should look to what the founders thought and all that kind of thing well like i said it wasn't in those documents so you're not you're looking in the wrong place <laughs> the, that that concept came about because during uh thomas jefferson's uh presidency there was a church that sent him a question about what they could do and couldn't do and all that. And he wrote a letter to them saying that the Constitution has set a bar between church and state. That's not in the Constitution. That is not in a law. That is not in a... Uh, uh, did, it, it wasn't handed down by the uh, judiciary and, uh, and, and in a decision or whatever. It came from a letter that Jefferson sent to some church and has been taken. As a matter of fact, it, the letter was discovered years, 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 years later when they went back and looked. And ever since then, there's been this concept that there has to be an absolute bar between church and state. Now, is that a good idea? Even though it doesn't come from the Constitution, Declaration, any laws, or a judicial decision, is that a good idea? Well, let me ask you this. Remember what I said? What happens when you take the church out of, or, or God out of the decision making, even of a government? What do you get? And is that then fertile territory for the demons to come in? If you believe in scripture, it says that the demon leaves and walks through a dry area, dry land, and then he comes back even stronger then uh, uh, when he left, so the demons look for empty places that they can fill up with him and his friends. Like I say, they put up a mailbox and uh, wait for, this is my home. So you got, a, you got a bit of an issue when it comes to a godless government, okay? Because if God's not making the decision, then who is? Therefore, I mean, that's, that's what kind of fuels all these evangelists who feel that God needs to, God, God's word needs to be followed, you know, uh, by this government, word for word, 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 word. And they're willing to compromise all their principles and uh, allow evil things to happen. So something is really wrong with that picture, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Something wrong. And, and we're going to get into that, but not today. Okay. Um. All right, well, I hope that's clear for you. We, even though the Constitution Declaration didn't say move God totally out of the government, uh, it's developed since then as, as a rock, as a wall that cannot be, be bridged, they say. So that's, that caused a lot of problems today. All right, let's go on. We need to understand saying some critically important terms. First off, when we look at the documents, um, the Declaration, the Constitution, it talks about the people, right? And then, and we the people, that's the Constitution preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to perform a more perfect union, establish justice. Now, what do they mean by we the people? If you've been following along, you know that didn't include the slaves, that uh, uh, African-American slaves, African slaves, 
They didn't include the African free people. It didn't include the Indians. It didn't include the uh, Hispanic people. Didn't include any of them. Didn't include Asians either. Right. Didn't include any of them. So when they talk about we the people of the United States, who are they referring to? And like I said, if you've been following along, you know that they're referring to the uh, white European landowners or the rich because remember who they gave the right to vote men landowners that's what they're talking about and and basically saying that we the people who are who are uh, uh, European who are uh, landowners um, we have the right to form a more perfect union. All right? So understand, and, and, and when you think of that, think also of this term, the majority. And think of this term, the minority. Since we, the people, only included those uh, European white uh Landowners, or the rich people, or whatever, which one would you put them in, the majority or the minority? Well, it, it all depends on who is even getting counted. Exactly. But let's say we count everybody. Who would you put the uh, rich landowner Euro Europeans in? They're the minority. In the minority. Exactly. They use those terms in these documents and... Um, when they talk about we're protecting the rights of the minority, you are taught that that means we think of minorities as uh, blacks are called minority, right? Mm -hmm. We think of, 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 of the little guy. But the reason I put this terms, these terms as important terms we need to remember is that you're looking at it backwards. <laughs> we look back, see what they meant, what they thought. They thought the minority is the ruling class. The majority is everyone else. And so when they put in protections of the minority, they were talking about protections of themselves. Hence why we have a lot of things that don't make sense, like two senators per state, no matter what the population is, mm -hmm. and the electoral college. Mm -hmm. All of those are designed to protect the uh, minority, basically, and well, give, the, give the minority an, an opportunity to rule over the majority. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, there were some people back then who uh, were dealing with voting on this Constitution and all that who said, no, we need to have some individual rights. And so they came up with this Bill of, right, uh, of, uh, Bill of Rights um, to add to the Constitution. And so you got these competing issues and theories and all that kind of thing, which in the long run, they don't mix well. They don't mix well. But even up to today, the minority rules over the majority. What do you mean? Let's take the Senate. Almost every one of them. Even the black ones or whatever are now rich. If they didn't, if they weren't rich before, if they were rich before, they're richer. If they weren't rich, they're now rich. Not so much when the House of Representatives, but they all want to become senators. So, so they can well, some of them don't. I mean, people serve in the House for thirty years or something like that. They obviously are not trying to become a senator. No, they want to be a senator. They can't <laughs> become a senator. <laughs> They would want to be, and then, okay, I have to agree with you that not everybody can be fit into the same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. But what you find and what you found in uh, today is when uh, the majority of the uh, uh, House of Representatives voted not to uh, approve the uh, uh, election for Biden. I'm talking about the Republicans. Um, 
It was only the majority of Republicans. It wasn't the majority of the whole House. Exactly. You understand that there are some in there that aren't following what they're supposed to do, too. And right. then, then when it came to impeachment of somebody who is who is definitely guilty and needs to be removed, they they don't do that either. They are the minority telling the majority what to do and how they're going to live. Keep that in mind. We the people, who the people? We the uh, majority, not we the majority, we the minority, and we rule over the majority. Those are terms that, that, that we need to keep in mind. Now, um, see, in a pure democracy, the power group, which can change at any time, a pure democracy is 51%. And you say, well, then, then they're the uh, majority. And all. But that can change next election. Okay? You kind of go back and forth. Uh, the minority um, in a pure democracy is a group without power, which can change again at the next election. So don't believe everything that you've been taught. One of the things that I've been doing laying the foundation of this study is that we've been taught some things, right? We've been taught some things that are true. All right? We have been, to a certain extent, brainwashed. And when the truth comes in, there's resistance, and people want to wanna, uh, dog you out and everything. The founders are not really who you think they were. <laughs> this country <clears throat> is not really what you might have thought it, it, it was. That's not to say that it can't be. This is that whole striving for the more perfect union. It can be that shining light on the hill that Reagan talked about. Okay? But it ain't there. And so, what happens with this concept of separation of church and state is that this state that was the United States has done some horrible things. Horrible things. Let's start this video. I'm not going to... Uh, we're not going to see it all, I don't think. But I want to give you some truth. Now, I, I caution you. There are a couple cuss words in there. Uh-oh. Okay? So, so put up your uh, shield and, and don't listen to those. <laughs> and and this is a bit of a uh, report from a guy that's a socialist, okay? Because I'm saying socialists think that, that the rule of the government should be on the people. Okay? And so, but unfortunately, they think it's also the first step to communism or whatever. So this guy is probably has a socialist bent, but there's a lot of truth in what he's saying about the United States. And so, let's hear it. This work and others like it has been brought to you by Patreon. Shout out to my contributors, the names of which are on screen. Your gratuity is greatly appreciated. If you enjoy this no content money. and would like to support me in my efforts, consider becoming a member for as little as $2 per month. Thank right. you again, and on to the video. There's a great deal of mythology surrounding the founders of the United States of America. Conservatives and liberals alike love to appeal to the Founding Fathers as these great authority figures, whom, with respect to political policy or agenda that they argue for, would certainly agree with them and be on their side of whatever issue that they're repping for, effectively arguing the case that their political agenda is the most constitutionally sound and in line with this ideal that ought to be. On one hand, liberals will invoke the Founders as these great men of noble progressive ideals, effectively appealing to the more progressive elements of America's national tradition as to argue for left-wing reform. The genius of the Constitution is that it can always be changed. The genius of the Constitution is that it makes no permanent rule other than its faith in the wisdom of ordinary people to govern themselves. On the other hand, American conservatives will do the exact same thing, except they'll point to the more overtly reactionary components of the founders as to justify preserving the status quo, that is, when they're not also trying to argue for the metaphorical rolling back of the clocks to an earlier period of time when things were supposedly better. See that flag? I would die for that flag. The Constitution that you were supposed to uphold? I would die for that! Today, I come to you as an enlightened centrist. Nope, not that kind of centrist. Yeah, that kind. 
to tell you that the liberals and the conservatives have it all wrong. Today, I'm here to explain the true nature of the Founding Fathers as well as the establishment of this country, what they really meant when they spoke of freedom, liberty, and democracy, to whom that freedom and liberty was actually intended for, why the Founding Fathers actually suck and were shitty revolutionaries, how striving for the ideals of the Founders in this day and age means setting the bar incredibly low, and why we as a society should strive to go well above and beyond the original ideals of the United States entirely. Back in the 1700s, during the foundational years of this country, the white settler population of the early United States primarily constituted small farmers, landed tenants, proletarians, and indentured servants, the latter of whom were functionally slaves with term limits. Property qualifications barred the vast majority of the white population from voting or running for office, and even when said qualifications were lifted, Many simply did not have the money or the resources needed to commit to politics since the working population were burdened with rents, high taxes, bonded servitude, and private debts. Even with the lifting of property restrictions after the Revolutionary War, due to the common man's economic destitution and general precarity, due to the disenfranchisement of women, blacks, and indigenous people, politics was still then, and still is to this day, by and large, a rich man's game. And thus, with no representation coming from the masses below, the founders of this country exclusively constituted wealthy white slave owners, plantation owners, merchants, barons, bankers, and manufacturers, most, if not all of whom, had inherited their wealth and privilege. Among these wealthy propertied white men include the likes of figures we all know and love, such as Washington, Madison, and Jefferson. And with all the levers of power in the hands of these wealthy, white, property-owning men, they would set about constructing a nation that was a rich man's paradise. Numerous legal anti-democratic fail-safes were built into the political apparatus with this goal in mind, including, but not limited to, the Supreme Court, or a council of nine unelected, unaccountable judges which have the power to kill any legislation in the water deemed unconstitutional. The Electoral College or a system of delegates designed to slant the presidential election results in the favor of the more reactionary candidate every single time. Filibustering, or the deliberate stalling and prolonging of a debate done by a minority of senators in Congress in an attempt to stop the passage of a bill. Voter suppression, or the deliberate curbing of the number of people allowed to participate in the election on completely arbitrary grounds. Lobbying, or the inherently insular pay-to-play nature of political participation and campaign finance, which has always been an omnipresent facet in this country as evidenced by the fact that the founders themselves were all wealthy, white, property-owning men. We will review these legal, democracy-terminating levers in detail in a future video. For now, all you need to know is that the founders put these levers in place as to design a political system that deliberately doesn't work, the reasoning of which will be explored here in a moment. In Madison's Federalist Papers 10, he writes in detail about the need to suppress the democratic will of the majority. Quote, The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man, and we see them everywhere brought into the different degrees of activity according to the different circumstances of civil society. But the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with the many lesser interests grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. When a majority is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the rights of other citizens, to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of such a faction, and at the same time to preserve the spirit and form of popular government, is then the great object to which our inquiries are directed. By what means is this object attainable? Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the exact time must be prevented, or the majority, having such coexistence passions or interest, must be rendered, by their numbers and local situation, unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression, 
If the impulse and the opportunity be suffered to coincide, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequate control. From this view of the subject, it may be concluded that a pure democracy can admit of no cure for this mischiefs of faction. Hence, it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with the personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Theoretic politicians, who have patronized this species of government, have erroneously supposed that by reducing mankind to a perfect equally in their political rights, they would, at the same time, be perfectly equalized and assimilated in their possessions, their opinions, and their passions. A republic, by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place, opens a different prospect and promises the cure for which we are seeking." Unquote. Next up, here's what Jefferson had to say about democracy in his first inaugural address. Quote, All too will bear in mind this sacred principle, that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will, to be rightful, must be reasonable, that the minority possesses their equal rights, which equal laws must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Unquote. Questions. Who do you think that it is Jefferson and Madison and the rest of the founders were referring to when they spoke of the need to curtail the will of the majority? What is it you think that they actually meant by preventing oppression by protecting the rights of the minority? Who is this minority that they speak so fondly of and seek to bend over backwards accommodating the rights of? Were they the Mexicans and the Indians whom they slaughtered and chased off their land? Were they the African slaves whom were being imported across the Atlantic Ocean to do forced labor on their private plots? Of course not. The minority which the founders were referring to were the wealthy, white, property-owning men to which they themselves were a part of, and the freedom which they sought to secure was the freedom to invest, the freedom of property, the freedom to enslave and genocide and exploit those beneath them the freedom to enrich themselves off of the hard work of others, and the so-called tyranny of the majority that they speak of is in reference to the masses below, whom would encroach on their freedom to own, exploit, and accumulate. They're the minority that needs protection from the majority, intruding on their property rights. In other words, the civil rights and the economic rights, the human rights of the poor working majority come to an end where the property and conquest rights of the affluent minority begin. So what the founders really meant by a free society was a rich man's playground, where they had the freedom to exploit, to steal, to rob, and to enslave those beneath them. In other words, a free society where they were free to restrict the freedom of others. In wake of this well-documented and plainly obvious historical fact, liberals will try and belabor the case that the founders were a product of the time, and despite their flaws, they were genuine and authentic in their pursuits to build a free country. And that can be true. From manifest destiny to taxation without representation, to a secular government of elected representatives within a constitutional republic for the people and by the people. It can be true that the founders were completely sincere in their efforts and intentions, while it can also be true at the same time that they were trying to do so within the context of their own class interests. Unfortunately, due to the inherently contradictory nature of trying to realize a free and just society while simultaneously trying to maintain a class system by which its very nature works in the direct reverse opposite of that goal, the resulting cognitive dissonance in the wake of this becomes incredibly laid bare and obvious, especially when one looks back to the likes of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Back in their day, Jefferson and Washington wrote scathing condemnations of the institution of slavery, while at the same time, were slave-owning men themselves, owning hundreds of pieces of human property whom conducted forced labor on their gigantic private plantations. And when one factors for the real motivations behind the Revolutionary War, the settlers and the founders' class interest becomes even more laid bare. Quote, the European settlers in the USA had been involved in the slaughtering of Indians at least since their invasion of Roanoke in 1607 and Plymouth in 1620. Although Britain advised the settlers to pay for the land they seized, such a requirement was virtually impossible to enforce, especially since the colony states had been made fairly autonomous, 
even when local British military forces formally forbade settlers from invading Indian territories, enforcement was very difficult without more troops and more formal British laws. As a result, until 1763, the settlers were able to freely steal from the Indians and kill any of them who got in their way, and even in instances of actual settlers' purchase of land from the Native Americans, fraud was normally involved. Within such an environment, fighting naturally broke out frequently. In an attempt to help protect both themselves and their land from the invading American settlers, many Indians allied themselves with the French in various wars, as well as politically with Britain in some of the continuous disputes over settlers stealing their Indian property. While frontiersmen like George Washington saw the proclamation as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of the Indians, and while there were numerous attempted breaches of this law, including an outright military invasion of Indian territory by Virginia militia in 1774, the Indians, with some British encouragement in the complex political environment, had some success in enforcing the proclamation. In fact, the 1763 legal infringement on settlers' right to steal Indian land was one of the primary motivating factors in the American Settlers' Revolution from British rule 12 years later although important tax and trade issues were also involved in the conflict. Most Indians quite naturally sided with the British against the USA in the Revolutionary American War, which lasted until at least 1782 west of the Allegheny Mountains. Despite some French political assistance later in the war, USA attempts to win Indian neutrality with treaties promising to steal no more Indian land and to engage in friendly trade, though which the Indians hoped to obtain the weapons needed to defend against their settler encroachments on their land, were foiled by continued USA settler invasion of Indian territories and by the USA's failure to pay for goods traded with the Indians. After the United States' victory over Britain, the white settlers were freed from British legislation prohibiting the theft of more land from the Native Americans. As a result, it became possible for more USA territories and states to be created out of further areas stolen from the Indians. The USA initially claimed all Indian territory as its own, arrogantly announcing that the Indians as a whole had no right whatsoever to their own land, and offered the Indian nations the choice of various small reservations under USA domination or the destruction of their women and children, unquote. Murphy, Triumph of Evil, page 32-33. And so there you have it. The real motivation behind the Revolutionary War was because, under British law, the colonists were forbidden from engaging in outright wanton genocide and land theft of the natives, and were obligated to respect their property rights. As you can see, the founders didn't like that. Nor did they like the fact that Britain, in the following years, had outlawed the institution of slavery as well. Furthermore, many Africans and indigenous people joined up in arms with the Redcoats against the Yankees during the Revolutionary War for the simple reason that the British weren't out to genocide and enslave them like the Americans were. So in the centuries that followed, it should be no surprise that America ended up stealing 80% of its new land from the natives and it ended up taking widespread slave revolts everywhere out in the Caribbean and a fucking civil war in order to bring an end to slavery. And of course the country is founded on the double standard. That's our history. We were founded on a very basic double standard. This country was founded by slave owners who wanted to be free. So they killed a lot of white English people in order to continue owning their black African people so they could wipe out the rest of the red Indian people and move west and steal the rest of the land from the brown Mexican people, giving them a place to take off and drop their nuclear weapons on the yellow Japanese people. You know what the motto of this country ought to be? You give us a color, we'll wipe it out. Just so you know, viewer, history did not have to pan out the way that it did. During the foundational years of this country, the founders never had to maintain the institution of slavery. They never had to wipe out and steal all of the land from the Native Americans. They could have abolished slavery on the spot and enshrined the right to self-determination directly into the Constitution and instead chose to coexist with the natives from the start. Instead of just saying that they stood for freedom and liberty, they could have actually went about implementing the socioeconomic reform, 
which would have actually realized the outcome, leading to the most freedom and liberty for all, rather than a tiny minority of wealthy oligarchs at the expense of literally everybody else. They could have brought about land reform, the abolition of rent-seeking, and the implementation of an economic bill of rights granting people legal equality as well as economic equality. They could have actually stood for something and put the classical liberal principles into practice as prescribed by the likes of Adam Smith and John Locke. But they didn't. They just couldn't help themselves stealing all that land, hoarding all that wealth, and enslaving all those people, apparently. So with that being said, stop giving credit to these people for your rights, and instead start giving credit to these people, because they're the ones who actually fought for them. Wow. All right. Um, and the part that he was about to get into is you're going to show the people that you should give credit to for your rights, and that would include the uh, Martin Luther Kings and um, uh, Hamers and and all that. All right. Well, I wanted to show you that, and uh, sorry about some of the... Yeah, there was a little language little in there. language in there. Sister Michelle said, I got my shield up. <laughs> sorry about all that. But um, as, I ha ha as I have on the screen here, keep in mind the terms we the people, majority, and minority, which may, in your mind, a lot of people's mind, have reverse meanings than what they really meant what the founders meant. Because I had said in a previous uh, uh, broadcast, either last week or week before, the, um, the founders were trying to protect their money, their business, and all that. And that's why you, you, you couldn't include the slaves in that. Why? Because they were property. And that's what fueled their business. And uh, the Indians, they were just in the way. They were in the way. So when they talk about we the people, you know, we get the uh, impression we're talking about all the people. No, that's not what they meant. And when they talk about majority, they are talking about all of us. And so they protect the rights of the minority. All right. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> I think you've got, you've got enough to chew on right now. And um, we're going to get deeper into this as we go along, we're going to, next week, we're going to talk about the Constitution and slavery. The Constitution and slavery. That's Not next subject. week, next year. I'm sorry. Marvel, tell us when we're coming back. We're coming back on January 7th to talk about the Constitution and slavery. That's right. And so, until then, hopefully you um, have a lot to chew on. You go back and take a look at this and all that and start coming up with some of the questions that you may need answered. And we will do our best to try to answer those. Um, anything else? Uh, when we start off on January 7th, I'd like to review what we just saw in that video and really kind of uh, break that down because it was it had a lot. It did. It had a lot. It had a lot of truth in there. Yes. A lot of truth about this country. And so... Uh, Laying the stage for us to understand what Billy Graham said, which is the, that the uh, 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 Bible is superior to the Constitution. And what the other theologian said is that it comes down to one point. you got to choose which one you want to follow. Now, there's some things that are incorporated into there, into the Constitution, that com uh, comply with Bible. But you got to understand the Bible versus the Constitution, to me, is a no-brainer. Okay, I don't have anything else today. We're going to let you go. Um, Merry Christmas to everybody. If you don't know, is Christmas, what, eight days away? Uh, and, I mean, if, if, if you're into that kind of thing, you need to run on out and spend all your money. <laughs> so... <laughs> And take the next six months to pay those bills. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> but anyway, it is the uh, keep Jesus in the season, the reason for the season, the, um, the birth of Jesus, who is our Savior. We are not deists, okay? We believe in the Trinity. We believe in the divinity of Christ. We believe in salvation. And so 
take that and think about those things as you go through this Christmas holiday. And plus, Happy New Year to all you. Uh, 2023? All right. Don't go out and get drunk and all that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> because remember, the government holds a sword. <laughs> but anyway, we hope that you guys have a great time over the time. We'll be back on the 7th. And we're going to get deeper, take a deeper dive into the Constitution and the Bible. All right, let us pray. Our Father and our God, I want to thank you, Father. You are, you are opening our eyes, Father. You are with this presentation of the truth, with this presentation of the Word, Father. So we won't be deceived, Father. So that we'll understand that, yes, we are in the midst of spiritual warfare coming from some different places, in different ways, and that is trying to delude us and fool us into thinking that things are divinely inspired when they are not. So, Father, we thank you for that. We ask you to bless tune in all those that will review this uh, at a later time, Father, and put a hedge of protection around all of us as we go through this holiday season, Father, and then we come out safely and return here on the 7th. We ask all this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved. Rightly to find the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom. So we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Want to hear him say good Good and faithful servant Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, Lord joy of the Lord. Of the Lord.